You're heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Hey, buddy. Brian McClanahan here. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. We're glad to be back. This is Episode 12, covering the week of February 1 to February 5, 2016. And so we've got a lot of good stuff to talk about this week. Again, we got our conference coming up in Charleston, South Carolina at the end of the month. Here we are in the month of February, so we've only got a couple of weeks uh, to, to really get into that. Uh, in fact, the uh, discounted rate for the hotels is up in about a week. So if you want to get a good rate on the hotel at the conference location, you need to uh, think about reserving your hotel room now and uh, paying and, and getting involved in the conference. Uh, it is going to be a great time, the PC attack on the South. We're going to have a lot of fun. So two-day event, Friday and Saturday, Friday night. We've got a uh, little program dealing with uh, what this PC on the attack on the South means. And then Saturday we get into the meat of the material. We've got a really nice banquet for Saturday night. So we hope to see you there. Uh, please come on out um, and uh, help us explore what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition. If you can't make it, think about a tax-deductible donation to the Institute. That'll help us do things like this, this podcast, the website, all the things that we do to try to explore our mission and um, keep these things uh, out there in the public for you and, and for everyone else who, uh, who enjoys them and also for the people that don't enjoy them because our side needs to be told. So uh, please consider supporting the Abbeville Institute, www.abbevilleinstitute.org. All right, so uh, this week we had some really interesting articles um, and some funny articles, so I, I think um, it, was, it was a good week. Um, again, no, no theme uh, where we had uh, articles dedicated to a certain or particular theme for the week. Uh, but the theme is always a Southern tradition, and so we'll talk about that. But uh, the first article of the week on Monday was titled, What's Holding Alabama Back? And it was written by Tom Daniel. Now, um, it's a very Louis Grizzard esque article, and that's how uh, Dr. Daniel writes. Uh, he's, uh, he's very proud to be from Alabama, very proud to be from the South, and he takes great offense to people that are critical of the South um, because in, in his mind, which he's correct, there's nothing to be critical about the South, at least in the way that people are critical about the South. Uh, so he, he starts this article um, about he was watching a, a Montgomery, Alabama newscast and the reporter was out on the street, and she was. Uh, uh, they put a box out, and it was was holding Alabama back. And everyone was going to use a little sharpie and write in the in the index card and and put it in there. And uh, they were going to list all the things they thought were holding Alabama back. And so, um, so Tom Tom starts, uh, you know, criticizing this. Well, why would you even have this in the first place? Uh, and then, of course, people were putting uh, things like, you know, Auburn was holding Alabama back and, and that kind of stuff. But uh, the very first thing that uh, he said that most people thought about was education. And so uh, it, Tom says, well, what, what person wouldn't say this in any state? But, of course, this is the problem. He says that, you know, people look at Alabama and they think it's, it's just backwards because it's in the South. Um, and then he, he's very proud of Alabama. He defends it. First, he says, uh, so is it, uh, you know, is it, is it race relations that are making Alabama back? And he said, look, I'd put Alabama right now up against any state in the country in terms of race relations. And the last time they, we saw any, um, uh, any kind of footage of race riots in, in Alabama, it was, uh, you know, when TVs were still in black and white. And uh, it's, it's been that long. Alabamas have gotten over it, moved on. Uh, but you did see uh, race riots in uh, many northern cities in color. So he's saying, you know, and, and this is, we've had articles about this on the website how the most segregated cities in the United States are predominantly found in the North, not the South, and how the, the North gets a free pass. And, in fact, the article for, for uh, Thursday is going to talk about that, too. Uh, and then he, he spent a lot of time looking at um, uh, rankings for Alabama and how they rank very high in, in most things. Uh, but he points, out a very, he points out something very interesting here. Um, he says, so if these rankings are accurate, how can we explain the original question? What's holding Alabama back? And he says the, the answer is perception. Quote, Yankees need Alabama to be in bad shape so they can feel good about themselves. As long as Yankees perceive that someone else is doing worse, they can perpetually avoid their own social rehabilitation, which is way overdue. 
So what if Alabama's not in bad shape? He says, simple, just ignore the truth and perpetuate the lie. It works every time. And that's true. You can look at this in so many different things in regard to the South and how people perceive the South, that the North has no problems. Uh, the, the North is, uh, this, as, as Tom called it one time, this imagined utopia of, of uh, tolerance. And, and it's not. You know, I, I call this self-righteous, uh, Yankee, delu- or self-righteous uh, Yankee delusional disorder or Yankee self-righteous delusional disorder, excuse me. They, they have this idea that everything in their own backyard is perfect, so they need to go out and, and uh, take care of everybody else's backyard. And this goes all the way back to uh, the Puritan North. And so the next article, we get into uh, some uh, uh, things about the South and what makes Southern culture unique. But the, the Puritans were, were always doing this, right? So, um, And then he says he has a long-standing challenge to uh, Northern friends, and none of them have taken it. He says this, next time somebody asks you where you're from, just say Alabama. And then, no matter where you're, where you're from, you know, tell them Alabama. And then he says, what's going to happen there is people look at you like you've lost 25 IQ points because you're from the South or you're from Alabama. They, they even look, you know, if, if, they're, if you're even wearing shoes, right? Um, so he said, if you say you're from Michigan or Connecticut or Oregon, then, oh, you got a new friend, and they're going to think you're smart and everything else. But if you're from Alabama then you're going to get these looks. And his last line is great. What's holding Alabama back? If I had stopped at the table, I would have written Yankees, which is true. So, anytime you can read something from, from Tom, I highly recommend it. Again, he's, he writes in the, in the style of Louis Grizzard, a little bit of humor sprinkled in, but a lot of truth. And so, um, it, it's a very good, very good article. Now, we go from that light piece, which is, you know, we write, we've published light pieces on the website. We go from a light piece to a fairly dense piece uh, that uh, was written by a early 20th century uh, literature professor at Duke University uh, named Edwin Mims. And it's part of the South and the Building of the Nation series. It was a chapter from the book on the social life of the South. <clears throat> Mims was an interesting guy. He taught many of the southern uh, agrarians, you know, the fugitives and then the Nashville agrarians, he taught many of those people uh, in his literature courses. So he was highly influential. Mims was also an interesting uh, individual because he was a progressive southerner. He he really wasn't uh, on the right. Now, I mean, nowadays anyone would look at Mims and say, oh, he's on the right. Uh, but at the time, he was not considered to be a conservative southerner. Uh, in fact, he, he spoke quite openly about being a progressive uh, but he loved the South, and he loved what the South could offer. Uh, he was also an, op- an opponent of lynchings and, and wrote quite a lot about that and thought that uh, white Southerners could do better in their treatment of black Southerners after the war. So he's, a, he's, he's kind of this guy that's on the left. And I think that's something that's important to note. You know, There are Southerners on the left who love the South. Nowadays, we don't think that. We think if someone's on the left, they just hate the South. But there were Southerners on the left who really loved it and loved the Southern tradition, loved what the South had to offer. If you read I'll Take My Stand, and I remember, uh, you know, I talked about this on, in an earlier podcast. Uh, when, I, when I was assigned that book in graduate school, and I was, I was happy about that because I had read it several times before. But there was a, a fellow sitting next to me, he was a, he was a hippie, and uh, he loved the book because it offered a critique of modernity and consumerism that he found refreshing uh, as this kind of green individual, right? The greens. Uh, so this agrarian life, the, the, the desire to live the agrarian life, has manifested itself in organic farming, uh, you know, small local farming. That's exactly what the agrarians are talking about. And this, this 19, you know, well, he was younger, but that 60s generation that later got older and they started getting interested in these type of ideas, this is what the agrarians were talking about. Uh, and they thought that the South was going to be the last section to resist this consumerism and urbanization and, and industrialization, and that we were going to have an attachment to the land uh, that was deeper than anything else. And unfortunately, it's going away in the South. I mean, I, I think that you know, the South is still predominantly rural, and you still find a lot of people that, um, that love the rural lifestyle and love the rural South. But just like every other section in the United States, the South is moving towards industrialization and consumerism and 
you know, when you have uh, banking and finance more important in your city than you do the cotton trade or cotton mills, you've moved away from this very traditional South. Even having a cotton mill was, was moving away from the traditional South. So, uh, but Mim says, you know, there's something about the South that was good because it resisted this, uh, this Northern economy and this Northern society the longest. Now, that didn't mean that uh, it was just completely closed. And so this particular essay is entitled European Influences in the South. And anyone who's, uh, who's studied a little bit about uh, you know, Southern colonial history knows that there were two dominant British folkways in the South, what uh, David Hackett Fisher has called the Cavaliers and the Celts. And so Mims actually gets into the Cavaliers here. He, he doesn't really talk about the Celts at all, but he gets into this influence of Cavalier society in places like uh, Virginia and South Carolina, and he calls that the English influences in the South. Uh, and so he, he mentions, look, English influence in the South cannot be missed in places like Virginia, where you had planters like William Byrd, uh, and uh, the way that he, uh, he designed his home, the fact that he had a fine library, uh, and the fact that what they were trying to do was recreate English lifestyle in Virginia. The same can be said, he said, of Charleston. He says, as Virginia's social life was a reproduction of English rural life, so that of Charleston was modeled after that of London, the rich planters of the surrounding county, uh, country, excuse me, making, their, making their city their headquarters during the winter. Um, and so they often traveled to Europe, and what they wanted to do was, again, recreate English life here in the United States, or what became the United States, in Charleston, in South Carolina, in Virginia. A lot of these men were educated at European universities. If you look at the architecture of the city, you'll find that it's very, influ very much influenced by English architecture. So he says you can't get around the influence of the English and Southern life. It was very English. And he points out uh, Owen Wister's novel, Lady Baltimore. Uh, and uh, Lady Baltimore is about uh, Charleston. And uh, Wister says, against the background of modern industrialism and democracy, he draws an appealing picture of, quote, the most lovely, the most wistful town in America. So Charleston was this beautiful place. Virginia was this beautiful place in terms of society. And England was very much influential in it. Uh, then he gets into the French influence uh, in, in the South and how it, it um, <clears throat> there was the French Huguenot migration into South Carolina. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, of course, was uh, loved French culture. Uh, he talks about a little bit of the political influence. Um, he doesn't really get into New Orleans or Mobile. He mentions at the beginning of the piece that he's not going to get into great detail there. But he did say there was some French influence in, in terms of the intellectual uh, structure of the South from essentially the uh, the Virginia aristocracy or, or you know the Virginia planting class, and then in other uh, other places. Uh, scattered here throughout the South. Um, and Jefferson, of course, was highly influenced by French educational methods. And, of course, Jefferson founding the University of Virginia, um, the the French influence there was profound, he said. And then also that, that filtered into other parts of the South, for example, the University of South Carolina. Um, and the fact that uh, Thomas Cooper went to the University of South Carolina uh, and... Uh, was heavily influenced by the French. Uh, he was also educated in England, of course. Um, but he and Jefferson, of, Cooper taught at the University of Virginia, and then and then uh, Cooper later went to the University of South Carolina. He was very happy uh, to see that Cooper had a, a tremendous influence in um, in uh, the University of South Carolina. Of course, Cooper uh, was John C. Calhoun's ally and a strong advocate of free trade, and. Uh, so this French influence found itself in education, manifested itself in education in the South. Uh, German influence in the South uh, was also there. You had different pockets of, of Germans, 
uh, particularly in the Carolinas. Uh, if you go and you eat uh, Carolina barbecue, it's it's uh, it's a yellow mustard-based barbecue, which is coming from the Germans. Uh, he also mentions the fact that Texas had some uh, some German influence. Um, so the Germans, people would think that the Germans had a had little limited influence in the South, but they were there. And then finally, he gets into the Spanish influence, which uh, he says, uh, you know, places like New Orleans had it, of course, uh, and uh, definitely Florida. Um, so, uh, one in one particular case, you know, he talks about the how uh, a a, uh, a traveler uh, to uh, to New Orleans said, "quote Now I am with the Latins. I live in a Latin city. I seldom hear the English tongue except when I enter the office for a few brief hours." I see beauty all around me, a strange, tropical, intoxicating beauty. I consider it my artistic duty to let myself be absorbed into this new life and study its forms and color and passion. This is about New Orleans. Uh, and it was a Latin city, so he, he's mentioning how that you have this other influence in the South. So his point in all of this, his point in this entire piece, is to talk about what we would call today diversity in the South and how there were many different cultures in the South, all of European influence, and how those different cultures gave the South a particular flavor and influenced its people, uh, we tend to think of the South as not cosmopolitan, and he says that's just simply not true. The South eventually became more provincial, but uh, for a time it was very cosmopolitan. Now, his concluding paragraph is rather interesting. He says, And indeed, when all the influences that have been suggested in connection with southern communities and commonwealth have been freed from the limitations of the past, limitations due to solidarity and and to provincialism, the republic will be richer. The arrested development of the past may prove a blessing in disguise. The reaction against some of the excesses of modernity may be healthily aided by a section which has such a rich inheritance of romance, chivalry, and culture. This is a positive view of the South and what it can offer the United States. And again, this is what we're trying to do at the Abbeville Institute. What is it about the Southern tradition that we can offer the United States or people today? What can we offer American culture today? And we've spoken of that quite often, how Richard Weaver said, you know, nobody wants to live in the antebellum South, but the antebellum South can teach us how to live. Of course, Weaver was influenced by the agrarians, and the agrarians were influenced by Mims. So there's the continuity between, between the three. And, of course, uh, all of uh, you know, people that promote the South in the 20th century uh, are influenced by, in some way, by that agrarian vision. What is it about the South that's unique and beneficial to the modern world? Perhaps it's that main critique of modernity that's good for the modern world. You know, here you are listening to a podcast, so we're embracing modernity in some ways in technology. But at the same time, we're talking about a way of living that would reject certain aspects of that. That's important to note. Uh, It's not that Southerners don't want to live in modernity. And as uh, Eugene Genovese has pointed out, Southerners did think of themselves as modern. But they offered a critique of it that was so important to the fabric of society. In fact, many times they consider themselves to be modern They liked being modern, but they thought their modern was different from what a northern modern was, and their modern was better. (laughs) And they were right. So this is what we have to consider when we're talking about southern history. And one of the things I'm going to discuss on that Friday night talk is, is again, southern apologetics. And the question has to be asked if you are someone who's interested in the South and, and, and talking about Southern history and culture, how to talk about that? How, how, do we, how do we present the South in a positive light? Because that is the important thing to do. Uh, and you don't want to play onto the other side's field. So the question you have to ask yourself is, how do you talk about the South? And most importantly... What is the Southern tradition? What is it that we're hanging on to? Because if there's nothing valuable in in it, then then why even do this? 
We all know there's something is. There's something very tangible in the Southern tradition that's was worth hanging on to. And that South is larger than four years. And I think that's something that we need to constantly talk about. The South is not just four years of history. The South is 400 years of history and culture and critique and economy and politics. And so here Mims is getting back to the European influences, how, the South, how, the, how Europe influenced the South and how the South was much more cosmopolitan, much more intellectual than people actually think it was. I mean, if you, if you read, even uh, if, you re if you read many intellectual histories, you know, the mind of the Cassius, mind of the South, I mean, basically what you get out of these things, many of them, is that the South was the void of any culture, any intellect. It was this wasteland because an agricultural people could not have uh, a strong intellectual tradition. Now, we know this is not true. Even Southerners themselves said that at times. It's not true. We can find countless examples in the South of a strong intellectual tradition in many different ways, whether it's theology or politics. I mean, John C. Calhoun was an innovator in the way he looked at political philosophy. In fact, uh, the Tuckers would say that political philosophy, uh, the art of politics, was actually invented in the South. So we have to understand the South. We have to understand this very long tradition and where it comes from. Uh, and how it was so much influenced by a very rich tradition in Europe. It, didn't, it wasn't just poor white trash in the South. Uh, and it was, if you look at the South after the war, I mean, the poverty of the South was inflicted by the war and the victory of the North and how the South suffered because of that. It wasn't that way before the war. Now, this idea of, you know, what is an American? And tracing back to... You know, a provincialism, a critique that the South offered. So then you get to Clyde Wilson's piece on Wednesday, the way we are now, and you can see that in it. He talks about how he's never watched a Super Bowl or an NBA championship, never been to Las Vegas, never willingly listened to rap, hip-hop, or heavy metal music. He doesn't like San Francisco. He feels more at home in Europe than in New York City or Los Angeles. Uh, this is a critique of modernity. And so this is, if you look at it from that particular position, it's not that he's being an old curmudgeon and just complaining about modern society. It's a southern critique of modernity. Just like Mims was saying, well, look, this is the richness of the South. Clyde is saying, here is the poor of the North. And what happened was that this poor culture of the North has been foisted on the South. He says, I don't think that Boston is the fount of all good things in American history. He likes... John Tyler and Franklin Pierce. Well, I agree. And at the end, he says, I fear I'm a bad American. But, but I note that commentators on the present war keep remarking that America has never had a war on its own soil. Oh, really? Maybe I'm not a bad American, but no American at all. Well, we know that Southerners are Americans. In fact, they are America. And, and the American tradition is the Southern tradition, or at least the Southern tradition was what people thought about the American tradition. When they thought about America, they thought really about the South, not really the North. Now, after the war, that changed because the North won, and so it's a North over South position. And so Northern history and Northern literature and Northern institutions became American institutions, but up until the war, that was not the case. The South, when people looked at the United States, they thought, oh, the South is America. It dominated the political life of the South. Or the political life of the, of the United States, excuse me, for 80 years. So this is, again, getting to the idea of what is the Southern tradition? What are we holding on to? It's a critique of modernity. It's a critique of the things we're seeing and saying, you know, uh, perhaps there's a better way 
or at least an alternative way that we can offer people. And you don't have to live that way. No one's saying Southerners are not, uh, by default, puritanical. You live like us or you go away. Southerners are very welcome of other people as long as you just got along with us. The problem is when people come in and they try to force you to be like them. That's not Southern. That's Yankee. That's Puritanical. That's the Puritan tradition. The city upon a hill. My wife often calls it just sweeping around your own back porch, right? Sweep around your own back porch. Take care of your own family, your hearth, your home, your kin, your kith and kin. And let somebody else worry about their kith and kin. Live by example. Find communities that fit your lifestyle. Promote a way of living and say, this is how we live. It's good. You don't have to live that way if you don't want to, but this way is preferable. And, of course, you can associate with people that live like you. Freedom of association is a natural, natural right to associate with people that are like you, think like you. And that's all that, that Clyde is saying here. We have a critique, a southern critique of modernity that's, that's beautiful. And it's something that we need to recognize. It's not old-fashioned or fuddy-duddy. It's not, it's not an old curmudgeon view of society. It's the southern view of society, built, built in the colonial period, not out of the results of the war. What is it the south is trying to hang on to? Uh, what is it they felt was under attack? Now, the common response would be, well, it was just slavery. Well, that was under attack, they thought. And... But it was something deeper than that to them. It was society. It was their way of life. It was modernity attacking the South. And uh, they mentioned this quite often. If we lose... It's, if we lose, the hounds of modernity are going to be released on the South, and everything will change. And if you look at what's happening in modern society today, you know, Southerners talked about this over and over, how these things that we have, they predicted the things we have today, the cultural problems we have today, Southerners during the war and immediately after said, my gosh, this is what is going to happen. Modernity is going to overrun us. And this is what comes with modernity. Northern modernity. Um, oftentimes that period in the South, after the war, the postbellum period, which Weaver did write extensively about in the Southern tradition at bay, but that period of time is neglected. And even conservative writers don't, don't, don't think anything, the South had anything to offer there because they were just too provincial and worried about their own problems. This is not true. They were speaking quite often about what would happen should uh, they lose. And then after the war, they were still critiquing the society in which they were given. Uh, if you read uh, Augusta Jane Evans and her novel St. Elmo, uh, it was written right after the war. And it's, it's a critique of modernity in many ways. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a romantic view of what the South could offer people through the voice of a feminine hero, or heroine, I should say, Edna Earl. And so that is what the South offers. And this is all Clyde is saying. This is all Edwin Mims was saying. This is essentially what Tom Daniel was saying. Alabama's fine. We live like we want to live. Now, the piece on Thursday was entitled by Gail Jarvis and was titled The Confederacy, Oscars, and Social Justice. And so he gets into, of course, this, this current event, current issue where the Oscars are being critiqued because there wasn't enough minority, uh, there wasn't enough inclusion in the Oscars. There weren't enough minority nominees. And I just read yesterday that there's actually a talk about bringing back the black Oscars. Uh, so they're just going to segregate out the Oscars again. Uh, and that particular thing, what's happening there, is gets into the piece that I wrote actually for Friday. Uh, and this idea of inclusion, a complexity, uh, 
is that what we really want? Do we really want complexity? I mean, this is this is something we've talked about. We need to have inclusion. We need to have complexity in our narrative. We need to have complexity in our history. We need to we need to represent all sides. Is that what we really want? And essentially, that's what Gail Jarvis is asking here. Do we really want complexity, or do we not want complexity? Do we want really want inclusion, or is it, or is inclusion exclusion? Which we know that's the case. Inclusion means you promote one side and destroy the other. And of course, the thing that's being destroyed now in the South are Southern symbols from the war, uh, Southern heroes from the war, and it won't stop there. Uh, you know, it, it's not going to stop there. And he talks about how that's you know, there's always a there's always a, a, a give because people want they're, they're nice, they want to say yes, okay, we understand how you might not like this, so so uh, we'll we'll do this for you. And then there's it's never enough. There they they're never there's never a, a point where anyone's satisfied in this. There just always is a call for more. Essentially, to the point of excluding an entire side because one side doesn't like it. That's not real complexity. That's not real inclusion. Real inclusion is both sides. And Jarvis goes, goes on to say, discrediting Southern historical figures is often a political ploy to curry favor with certain voting blocks. This is the case with Georgia Governor Nathan Deal's Furtive removal of Robert E. Lee's birthday from the official state holiday list. In a truly democratic society, a radical alteration of state holidays should be subjected to a statewide referendum rather than just imposed behind closed doors. But Governor Deal, he says, and the Atlanta bureaucrats assumed that Georgians would be too docile to complain. Indeed, many Georgians did not complain, but others refused to thumb, others refused to thumb their noses at Southern heroes. They instituted their own celebrations of the anniversary of Robert E. Lee's birthday without state sanction. Jarvis goes on to say, Governor Jill's presumptuous attempt to eliminate the Lee holiday is part of a national trend to disparage hallmarks of American culture, literature, films, monuments, holidays, anything that conflicts with social zealots' notion of what is appropriate. However, the public didn't offer any serious objection as long as aspects of the South's culture were being extinguished. But when the public heard demands that the Washington Monument and the Jefferson Memorial be eliminated, it realizes that cultural genocide had gone too far. So Americans are willing to stop it at some point, as long again, as long as the South is the target. What's what's holding Alabama back? As long as the South is the target, they're fine. But what they don't realize, what they don't realize, is that the target is not really the South. The target is Western civilization. That is the target. In fact, if the cultural Marxists and the social cleansers had their way, I firmly believe that history would start, your history textbooks would start around 1965. And nothing before that would even be there. This is Orwellian. Now they would say, well, no, 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 no. We have to talk about the, the past and how bad it was, how evil everybody was, in the past, and we don't have any good. There's a few self, you know, good righteous people, and we'll have you know, long chapters dedicated to this. There was a piece not long ago, I think it was in the Washington Post, about how uh, with the statues coming down in New Orleans, about how the uh, the city of New Orleans should erect a statue to a Confederate leader. That should be James Longstreet. And what knows the history of James Longstreet knows why why Southerners did not champion James Longstreet after the war because he became a Republican. And uh, that was seen as a capitulation. It was, it was worse. He was a turncoat, a scalawag. And so this particular person says, well, we need, to, we need to honor these people, right? Let's just come up with some southern people that everyone can like because he was a Confederate soldier, Confederate general, uh, Lee's right-hand man, but yet he did the right thing after the war. And so, again, it all comes down to perception. Uh, in fact, that you know, the South has recognized Longstreet recently, more recently. There was a statue dedicated to Longstreet uh, in, in the near past. Um, but the, the point is to say, well, we need to get rid of these people that we find offensive and find people that we find okay in modern society. But the South put up statues to Lee and Davis, as they also put up statues to Washington and Jefferson, because they thought these people best represented what was there in Southern society. And Jarvis goes on to say, Washington, Jefferson, and Lee are great American heroes. 
Outstanding men who should be judged on the entirety of their lives rather than selected aspects that are at variance with today's political sensibilities. Perfect. It is ideological, he says, and unfair to judge persons of past generations by the standards of the current generation. Faulting Washington, Jefferson, and Lee for not rising above their time and place pertaining to slavery is like condemning Jane Austen for not being a feminist. Exactly. Now, he finishes, he finishes the piece by saying, Much to the chagrin of social justice busybodies, Americans haven't been convinced to reject their founding fathers. And opinion polls show that the majority of Americans still believe that the South past represents heritage rather than hate. Also, the tenacity of the South's respect for Robert E. Lee and Southern heritage is still intact, too solid to be dismissed. And so, that's true. I think that there still is a large block of the South, but uh, unfortunately, I think it's, it's, it's growing smaller. But again, here we have the Southern tradition. What Mr. Jarvis is, is doing is saying, look, we have the Southern tradition that's at variance with what people in, in the mainstream want today, and so you have to get rid of it. It's the same Southern tradition that people like Mims was talking about. It's a critique of modern society. The South, just by the South being there and having a different culture, having something that's not modern, is an affront. It's a threat. It's a real threat to modernity and what the modern left and some on the modern right want. Now, this doesn't mean that everyone's fine with getting rid of of the Southern tradition or the South. Of course not. But, uh, and even in in the mainstream, and have people that you wouldn't expect to defend the South have come out and defended the South recently. Uh, But... It persists, and as he says, they're busybodies. This is never going to stop, uh, and there's never going to be enough capitulation to appease them until practically every vestige of Southern history before 1965 is erased, or uh, you know we, we start writing history books that begin in 1965. Now, that said, this complexity, what is it we really want? So Jarvis is getting to that point. You know, they don't really want complexity. They want their view, their version of history, nothing else. No, no challenge to that. No challenge to their simplistic narrative of Southern history. Uh, no challenge to the simplistic view of Alabama. No challenge to the view that Southerners were just backward, which is what Mims is saying is simply not the case. No challenge to modern society from a Southern critique. And so the last piece of the week was titled, there's nothing like the old time ways. And I wrote this because of some things I was looking at recently. Most people are familiar with the Federal, uh, the, the federal Writers Project and the Slave Narratives, which wonderfully the Library of Congress has put online, both audio files of this and all of the narratives themselves. And you can go out and read these narratives. In the 1930s, what people, the, the federal government paid for people to go around the South and collect, collect stories, folk stories essentially, or first-hand accounts of slavery from slaves themselves. These are often cited. The problem with that many people have with them is there's a lot of positive accounts of slavery, or at least of the South, by the slaves themselves. And so they're often said they're grossly inaccurate. Now, of course, the negative accounts are are brought out and said, well, these are true. But anything that might be out for some complexity about the South, well, you can't, that's just not true. That's all lies. And this is essentially what happens. Well, this thing, you, you take both and you say, okay, uh, we, we've got these two things. Well, this is what people said it was like. And if they said this is what it's like, that's what it was like. I mean, you have to take the good and the bad. And I think that's the hang-up. And I'll, talk, and I'll mention that in the last, when I say that in the last paragraph. But one thing that people do miss, historians generally, is the literature. Is the literature. And particularly the literature right after the war. Now, people are familiar with Faulkner, and he writes in dialect, and, and I'm getting into the, the, the stories about dialect writing. So Faulkner used dialect. Faulkner's often mischaracterized as a liberal. Uh, and if you've read uh, Forgotten Conservatives in American History, the book that I co-authored with Clyde Wilson, Clyde actually wrote a chapter on Faulkner where he gets into this. Faulkner's not really a liberal. Faulkner was a Southern traditionist. Now, uh, he was critical of some things in the South, 
but he was critical in a way that allowed for Southern tradition to accept these and work with it, and I think that's important. It was, in some ways, also a positive view of Southern relationships and the Southern tradition. Now, there were other men and women who wrote in dialect, the most famous being Joel Chandler Harris uh, of Uncle Remus fame, and uh, Thomas Nelson Page, who we had an article about, who wrote in Old Virginia, Virginia. But there was one particular dialect writer named Anne Virginia Culbertson, who nobody really knows anything about. She was actually born in Ohio. Um, but she traveled around Virginia and North Carolina in the post-war years, interviewing black Southerners and then retelling their folk tales. She actually used to perform some of these. And these stories were decades old. And so I, I ran across her uh, in one of her works entitled Banjo Talks. And so I, I wrote about it here and some of the things that you find in the book. Um, they're not dreary recollections of Southern life. And that's what people would think to find. I mean, here she's interviewing uh, former slaves. She's interviewing people that uh, were living in the South, who we would con consider very poor today. I mean, they were. They were very poor. And there's wonderful pictures in the book uh, that she took, contemporary pictures of the people that she interviewed and people that she talked to in Virginia and North Carolina. Um, but they're, these stories are, are light. They're jovial. They're interesting. Uh, the, the first, where I took the title from, it, it, was a, it was a song called With the Spinning Lesson. And essentially what, the, what these women, these uh, African-American women are saying is that they love the South, the old-time ways. There's nothing like the old-time ways. I tell you them day, old days was days. And they showed joy uh, for being able to produce things, cotton. And the, 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 they spun and they dyed and they weaved and knit in their gardens. And then they said, and turned out garments that was fit for any person in this nation. There's a pride in that. That's something you're not going to hear. A pride. Even here in the institution, of, of course, this goes back to the plantation, right here on this plantation. It goes back to uh, the Old South. But there was a pride in uh, that particular part of it. They were happy with that. They were happy they were doing something that was beneficial. And then there was another uh, a song that I, I, I talked about. It was called uh, Knockin', Knockin' Durangatang. And uh, it's, it's dedicated to a, to a Christmas gathering and how uh, they were having a jovial time. And, and uh, if you read any of uh, any books uh, that were written before the war uh, about uh, Southern society, one of the things that uh, black Southerners quite enjoyed was the Christmas celebration. Even books like 12 Years a Slave brought this up and how this was a grand time. And so uh, there are several stories actually in this particular book dedicated to Christmas and how how much this community, the black Southern community, loved Christmas and how, how they enjoyed the celebration. Now, of course, also certainly you would you would expect to find the prospect of freedom as a welcomed event. And in this book, there is. There's actually a piece entitled Penance, and uh, this particular author talks about the joy at the coming of emancipation. And this uh, particular uh, narrator was so overcome with emotion at the birth of her baby that she is going to name Emancipation Proclamation Independence Day. And um, so you would, you would expect to find that. Freedom was a welcome event and, and wanted. So it's there, but it doesn't mean they look on the past and their time in the past and parts of that any less fondly. Then there's a piece uh, uh, entitled Just Looking On, and it's by an 80-year-old. So this, this, this uh, book was published around 1908. So this particular 80-year-old um, former slave that she interviewed talked about how you know it was about manners and how he had manners and how the people born after the war, the, the young black members, didn't have those same kind of manners and that they made fun of him because he was born a slave and day ain't been. And so he, he, he says these people are making fun of them. It's, it's, a, it's a harsh time for him. And so there's a critique of modernity there. This is what this is, a critique of modernity. What's happening in the South? 
And I mentioned that uh, you know other themes in the book include love, farming, Christianity, and a virtually careless appreciation for life and nature. There was no hint of social angst or physical degradations. Black Southerners, like many of their white counterparts at this time, lived on the land in what we would consider poverty today, but at least according to their folk songs, there was a certain calm and fluid oneness with the world. The same thing that the agrarians were talking about. And so I conclude with this. It is easy to accept harsh descriptions of slavery and black southern life in the 19th and early 20th centuries. They happened. But it is far less agreeable, maybe even palatable for some, to also accept the positive descriptions of black southern life that came from black southerners themselves. This is problematic. If we wish to live in a respectful society between black and white southerners, which, frankly, already exists on a daily basis, then we should be honest with southern history and show the south and the southern people in all their complexities. Hasn't that been the stated goal after all? Judging by our simplistic pop culture and education system, probably not. I am all for complexity. Let's talk about the South, the good and bad in the tradition, the beneficial and not beneficial. I don't think any Southerner should be offended by that. But make sure the positive gets out too. And that's the problem. I, I can almost guarantee you that you're not going to read Anne Virginia Culbertson in an American literature course. You, you won't read Joel Chandler Harris. You won't read Thomas Nelson Page at all. You might, you're going to read maybe one story from Faulkner, maybe a little bit of Flannery O'Connor. And the slave narratives are, ne are really never used uh, in any type of history classes dealing with the South. So let's talk about everything. I don't think there should be an issue with that. Let's have a Southern society, or at least a, a consciousness, a historical consciousness in the South that discusses the entirety of the South, positive and negative, because it's both there. And I think that's something that we need to continually discuss. One of the things we have to do is discuss, is have a very positive view of the South, an apologetics. And if we do that, I think people will learn to understand what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition, what we can use out of it, uh, you know, and how, uh, and learning how Southerners lived, it can teach us how to live in the future. Until next time, good day.